Good morning and welcome to this week's Football Digest. Um, as always, a very, very busy week to look back on, a very busy weekend to look ahead to. Um, I'm joined by um, Simon Bird from the Daily Mirror, Neil Moxley from the Daily Mirror, Chris McKenna from the Daily Star, and Simon Mullock from the Sunday Mirror. And, and Simon, I'll start with you because um, both you and Chris were there um, along with myself on Tuesday night. Um, it's the first chance we've had now to reflect um, on the passing of Bobby Charlton. And they did a great job there, as you'd expect, Manchester United. It was a very poignant evening on Tuesday to say those farewells, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, um, it, as you'd expect, for somebody of uh, Sir Bobby Charlton's stature. Um, everybody was extremely respectful, including the, the Copenhagen fans, who, um, who who sort of treated the evening with uh, with great courtesy and um yeah it, it was a it was a nice send off um well not send off but obviously a tribute to yeah to the great man um you know and I, I mean I've I've met and spoken to Sir Bobby a few times and um you know what can you say that that's not already been said this week you know not just a, a great footballer but um but you know a, a gentleman you know it's true he, he was a gentleman footballer and his love for the game always came through when you spoke to him. His love for Manchester United always came through. I remember talking to him one day after a game at Wigan, um, when um, uh, when sort of there was there was talk that Sir Alex Ferguson was about to retire. It was it was another false dawn as it transpired. But talking to him about who, who the who the next manager should be to replace. Sir Alex and and he was adamant at the time that, that that it shouldn't be Jose Mourinho because he felt that you know as as great a manager as Mourinho was at the time, he didn't fit the 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 profile of what a club like Manchester United needed in terms of having that style of football and having that that attacking flair and and that that demand to to play good football as well as winning football, which was quite brave at the time. But he was you know it it. it what what shone through for me that night was the fact that um you know his love for Manchester United came came first and foremost and um like you say it's it's a great loss not just to Manchester United but to uh, to football in general. Yeah, I mean, I mean, guys, I'm not I'm not going to go around um everyone. I think we could all Simon said it very well. You know, um I think the scale of the coverage that you've seen in the newspapers and across all all the media um is a reflection. I mean, of what we all know, that you know, Bobby Charlton was arguably the most important figure in English club football and in the English national team. And um, I, I think that the reaction to it from Manchester United has been very befitting, and um, they'll continue to honour him, and they'll honour him, I'm sure, fantastically well at this weekend's game. Um, Chris, I just did want to talk as well at the same time. Obviously, Everton is another club who's, who's suffered um, a terrible loss this week. Um, Bill Kenwright um, passing away, I think, on Monday. Um, and again, I think particularly if you look at the coverage locally, I know I picked up a copy of the Liverpool Echo and they've done a fantastic job, turned the Liverpool Echo blue in honour of Bill. And it's one of those times, Chris, isn't it, when... You know, Everton have been going through a really troubled time in um, both on and off the pitch over the last few years. Bill himself was at the the centre of that, unfortunately. But again, this is a time when those things are are quite rightly um, put aside and proper tributes paid to Bill's service and his love for Everton. Yeah, I, I think that was the great thing. Obviously, when Bill joined the club, it. it on the board in 89 and then um, kind of started to took ownership in, in 99. It was before my kind of time covering Everton, but what this week I suppose has brought is a, a reflection on, on what the work he did there, um, which was quite remarkable considering when you think he took over the club, it was his club, it was always his club. There's a great interview out there. Um, it was done by Martin Samuel a few years ago where he talked about those days on the Gladys Street end um and just just watching his heroes back then and he, he never dreamed of being the owner he just wanted a seat in, in the stand so he wasn't getting soaked by the by the urine or the we as he said coming down the stands at half time so it was the, the club was in his heart it wasn't just a business to him which you see with now with so many of these owners now all these football clubs are businesses to them that they're, they're a way to make 
to make money or to use for different means, whereas Everton was was his club. Um, and the job he did in those early years in the noughties with, with David Moyes at the helm, considering the teams they were up against, peak Ferguson, peak Wenger teams, absolute top-level teams, and they, they, they fought season after season above their financial kind of, uh, punching above their financial weight. They qualified for the Champions League one year. I know they, they didn't make it through the qualifiers then, but to even to get into that to that top four and break through that ceiling with the budget they had was was remarkable. And even the, the, then, when obviously the money comes into City and stuff like that, they, and they, the money just got, has just blown up in the last 10, 15 years now, he still just tried and tried and tried and tried. And they reached an FA Cup final. They, they, they were always for a lot of that time, up top six, top eight, which, again, was remarkable. And it, it was just kind of sad they never got that trophy for him because mm. he'd done so much for the club. He'd helped them to get so far. And I suppose it was kind of – it was sad in the way it ended. He he, he brought in Mashiri, who, who was somebody he felt would invest in the club and, and make them compete. And there's there's no doubt Mashiri did invest in the club, but it hasn't worked out. The money hasn't been spent in the right way. And – and he's bore the brunt of a lot of that criticism, which is quite kind of sad in a way, because I'm sure there'll be a, a tinge of regret now that people won't have been able to really show their appreciation. Because a lot of times when things turn sour with managers and, and owners and board members and that, they go away for 10, 15, 20 years. And when they eventually do pass, people have kind of, it's all been forgotten and forgiven about. Whereas what's happened with Bill, it's happened in the middle of all of this, but... I think when Everton fans do kind of look back on over his whole stewardship of the club, they can look back and see a man who always made the decisions he felt were best for Everton. Yeah, it's. I, I think some of the great things that have come out over the last 48 hours are the stories now of people who feel they can now um, they can now say the things that Bill did for them, you know, on the condition that they weren't made public at the time. You know, the donations he made, the generosity he showed towards supporters, towards towards people's causes. I, I, I love that that's now coming out, you know, and Bill insisted that that didn't happen. He could have easily had those things made public to try and, you know, improve his image when things weren't going well at Everton. I think that's great that, that comes out. Chris, I'll just stick with you briefly because you mentioned here that obviously he, he, he brought in Mashiri. He was very proud. Of, of bringing in that owner um it now seems that it's gone a little bit it's gone a little bit wrong can you just keep us up to date can you just give us the latest on this threat that was widely reported yesterday that if everton are found guilty of ffp contravention they could be deducted 12 points what's the latest on that yeah so the, the hearings ongoing um the Premier League have, have basically recommended to this hearing by an independent commission that they're seeking a 12-point deduction. Um, Everton's position, even though they're not commenting on anything, is still that they feel they, they haven't done anything wrong. They feel that when they present the case and everything is heard, that it will be shown that it was basically issues around accounting problems and the COVID-19 um, kind of regulations or the kind of allowances that clubs were given at the time. Obviously, when you look at the figures in bare facts, they, they were way, way over their limited allowed. So it's how they, they have to prove that. But I think what the, the Premier League have asked for is probably the top end. I would be stunned, absolutely stunned, if they yeah. get anywhere near that. I I, I feel that my, you may be looking at more maybe a fine and a suspended points deduction and a warning going forward. But again, it's in the hands of an independent commission, so we don't exactly know yet. But I think Premier League are maybe putting, showing a bit of weight around, showing that they mean business on it. But I'd be stunned if it was 12 points because that would leave the Premier yeah. League nowhere to go with other cases. Yes, well, exactly. I'm, I'm, we, we obviously know there's one very high-profile case going on um, at the same time as, as well. Jamie Carrigan had a comment to make about that. Um Listen, lads, we'll 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 we'll, we'll get on to the football because we've got so we've had so much football, you know, coming thick and fast now. The international breaks over. Champions League took centre stage. Simon, last night, um, I was there for the PSG game at St James Park, and it was the best atmosphere I've experienced for a long time. I'm sure it was similar last night, but not the result the Newcastle wanted or the performance, maybe. No, it was a massive reality check uh, for Newcastle last night. They, I think, they were. Done, outdone tactically by by Dortmund, 
who turned up in a, in a manner, a positive manner that PSG didn't. Um, yeah. Another great flag display, another great atmosphere, but, but Dortmund kind of killed it in the first 10 minutes by having two or three chances. And they really put Newcastle under a lot of pressure. They had they had three men up front. They had another two midfielders standing in between the lines, which confused Newcastle, who didn't know who to pick up. They had a great out ball down the right, which caused massive problems. And I've not seen Newcastle kind of opened up like that for a, a good long time. Um, having said that, Eddie Howe made some good changes second half. And they did shore it up and they had a lot of the ball second half. They hit the bar twice. They had two other good chances with Wilson and Gordon. That they could have scored. So they could have had four four goals themselves. Um, but the results last night with PSG winning really blow open Group F. And it's looking it's looking pretty tight now. So it was a it was a reality check. The other worrying thing for Newcastle with so many fixtures, 15, 14, 15 fixtures up until Boxing Day, is losing Tonali. Um, Harvey Barnes is out. Isaac's now injured. Um, Jacob Murphy went off with a, a dislocated shoulder. The the kind of the way their squad's going to be stretched um, is is going to be a huge problem going forward. Yeah, I mean that, that's interesting, Simon. Is it, it, the if you look at a team like City now who are accustomed to this now, they can they've got the same sort of fixture schedule, but they've done it now for five, six, seven years. They they know how to do it. It's new to Newcastle. I agree, and it's going to be as you said, the reality check probably wasn't. So much is in that one game, as in, well, hang on, what the expectations are um, over there over a longer period. It's going to be tough to uh, to juggle those. Again, Sam, I'll stay with you. What do we do? We expect a Tonali decision today. We think it's going to be today. I mean, it could, it, we've been expecting it for two or three days, to be honest. The plea bargaining has gone on, and the indications from Italy are that it's going to be. Well, he could have actually had a four-year ban because of the seriousness of the betting offences that had happened, but that's been sort of bargained down to. Ten, a 10 month ban from playing and he will be allowed to to train with Newcastle during that time he's got eight months of other other punishments which he's got to do meeting local associations and youth teams in Italy he's got to have counseling for the for the for the gambling that he's done um which was done when he was at Milan and Brescia so it's like a long term problem we expect it to be announced today and to, and also there's a there's a report in Italy that he's going to lose that he's not going to be paid or his wages are going to be suspended so we don't know whether he gets them later or whether he doesn't get them at all um, during that, that ten months which is fair enough because Newcastle are tight up against financial fair play and they'll be able to get a replacement in January for for him with Kelvin Phillips a, a possibility if they can get him out of City so um, yeah we're expecting that to be today it's kind of ten months um, he'll come back two or three games in the next season. And that's a huge, I mean, it's, Eddie Howe's been really kind of um, gentle and caring in the way he's deal with, with Tenali as a person. He's looked at this as a human being problem rather than a business problem. But if you actually look at the business problem that this has created in Newcastle, they've spent 55 million on a guy who three months later, through historical problems, which they didn't know about when they put the money on the table, is going to be banned for 10 months. It is a massive embarrassment to the transfer team. It's a massive cock up for the club that they haven't found out or known about this and whether we see legal action coming from Newcastle, whether we, there are some tight clauses in that contract that they signed with Milan, which means they don't pay transfer transfer instalments. Like it's, it's a, this is not, now going to turn into a possible legal wrangle with, with ramifications that we'll see in, in the court. But on a business angle, it's, it's a huge embarrassment for the club. And of all that money they spent in the summer, 150 million, they've got Tenali out through a betting ban. They've got Harvey Barnes out injured till January. And then they spend 50, Pledged 50 million on Livermento and Lewis Hall, who are, are backup fullbacks. So they're actually no further forward, having spent all that money in the summer than they were they were last season. Neil, I just I think great points there, Sam. I mean, really, really good points on on their spending there, and, and how it hasn't worked out well, not yet anyway. Neil, I just want to just from the outside. I'm I'm intrigued by the Tonali case, and from the outside, clearly, you know what Newcastle have done is. And Eddie Howe have done is offered him support. Um, said they, the club said they put an arm around him. The general instinctive feeling is to is for the player himself um, as a victim to a certain extent because his agents, as I said, has been uh, you know said he's a gambling addict. However, from the outside, you look at it, and I, again, I agree with Simon that you know that you should know they should have known about this. But would the player himself have not known when he's signing when he signed a contract for fifty five million pound transfer? You know, would he have had a duty to say to Newcastle, "Listen, by the way, this is coming down the line." You know, it, it, something. I 
basically, I think we need to know the full facts about this, about exactly what he is accused of, exactly what he has done, before we A, either start condemning him, or B, start having him as the out-and-out -out victim. Yeah, I mean, look, look, let's look at the real, realism of it, Andy. We've got um, a guy here who's on the cusp of a £55 million um, transfer to Newcastle United. Um, presumably that incorporated a, a massive pay hike, uh, a lengthy deal. Is he going to really jeopardise that by holding his hand up to a historical betting um, uh, historical yeah, betting that may or may not may or may not came, come out. I mean, interestingly, we've got um, Nicolo Zaniolo at um, Villa who's been caught up in this. Yeah, uh, and one of our colleagues from uh, uh, Gazette Adela Sport was at uh, Villa Park on on Sunday and very helpfully um, basically uh, filled in some of the blanks for us. But it seems as though um, Zaniolo was caught up. Um, basically, it seems as though his his uh, advice has been to bet on. Uh, non-state registered um, apps involving uh, casino type games such as black, blackjack and poker um, and uh, I'm led to believe uh, fr from him that um, uh, Tonali was you know has got, has got a problem um, but whether or not you know I don't know what everybody's you know um, experiences are of it but it's it's a difficult one to see from the outset you know if people have got uh, drug or drink addictions then you can see a physical um, deterioration in somebody, but gambling is a, a, a former long-term girlfriend of mine. Her, her dad had, a, had an issue, I think um, it's fair to say, and um, you know it was very, very, it was a very hard addiction to, to 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 live with because there's a clandestine element to it. People, you don't generally want people to know what's going on, and um, and the top and bottom of it is that I don't think Sonali would have jeopardised a massive contract by uh, coming clean, although. It would have been the right thing to do, and now Newcastle and, and Milan have got this unholy mess to clear up, and I can't yeah. honestly see ending in any other way than a cash arbitration. To be perfectly honest with you, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, and, and you know, you've got the whole ramifications of things like this are obviously the value of the player going forward, um, and whether he's breached any sort of contract. We'll see how that one works out. Back to the pitch, um, Newcastle. Um, the only English team um, to be beaten in, in the Champions League. I just want to look at a couple of the others. Um, Arsenal, um, I'll come to you. Uh, um, Simon, uh, um, Simon in North East, that's okay. I mean, Arsenal seem to be just, um, I wouldn't say going from strength to strength, but anyone who thought that they might have a dip after last season, they're, they're getting proven wrong, aren't they? Yeah, well, I, I think I said on the last time I was on here about a month ago that I thought they'd be stronger this year. I thought they'd really push City um, and I thought they'd be competitive on all fronts. Uh, they've just got to guard against any complacency uh, and keep driving it on. Um, they're looking like a, the, the real deal this year. Uh, I mean, the keeper problem is the, is the interesting one where he's where he seems to have created a bit of a bit of a hoo-ha behind the scenes with the with having his two two keepers and Ramsdale, England man there. But everything else seems to be functioning quite well. And I think if City are slipping up, they're, they're going to be right on the tails. And I also thought Liverpool, they've had a brilliant run. They've only lost once this season um, in a run of so many home games, six home games in eight uh, at the moment, Liverpool. I think they'll be up there. I think it's a three-way title race this year. Um, and yeah, I mean, Arsenal, I, I think from a neutral's point of view, I I'm, I'm don't follow those, those three clubs, but... Clo um, closely as a fan or anything, but it would be good if the title race could be mixed up this year and we could have a much more competitive Premier League and not just have Manchester City winning it. So I think it's in the interest of the the kind of Premier League and its competitiveness that Arsenal are, are right up right up there. And obviously, Simon, Simon, um, um, man, the, the win over Man City, you know, a very significant win in terms of their recent history in terms of this season's Premier League. City though have responded. Couple of wins. They needed those wins, and they? they needed and they needed that win last night in the sense of now they can probably qualify and almost certainly qualify in their next home Champions League game against Young Boys at the Etihad in a couple of weeks, and then can do a bit of squad rotation. So City are they back on an even keel, Simon? I think they um they're, they're still some way to go with City. I think they're uh, they're probably not out of first gear yet in terms of performance levels. And uh, don't know if any of you saw the game last night, but. I mean, Erling Haaland could have could have probably had two hat tricks if he'd have taken his chances. So he's not yet firing on all cylinders, which is quite frightening when you think he's still the top goal scorer in the country. 
Um, but that that win against Brighton was important, and um, and they were hanging on for the last fifteen minutes after uh, after Brighton got a goal back. Um, you know, they they started like really positively, took a, a very early two goal lead, um, and then Brighton came storming back probably after the hour mark, and and you know threatened to get an equaliser. So that was a big result against you know one of the informed teams in the Premier League, and obviously it sets them up nicely after winning in midweek. Sets them up nicely for the. Uh, for the Manchester derby on Sunday, um, which, as you can imagine, everybody in Manchester is uh, is looking forward to. Although I will say, some are looking forward to it more than uh, more than others. <laughs> what's what's that supposed to mean? Well, it, well, one one team's in form, and one team one team is 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 in decent form. The other team, despite winning a couple of games, <laughs> the performance <laughs> levels are still pretty. Um, they they're still not what you'd expect of Manchester United after what they. Achieved last year, you know. I mean, you were at yeah. Old Trafford on on Tuesday night, and it was a, it was a dire performance that, and they got off the hook really by the drama in the last few minutes. You know, the penalty save, um, big night for Onana, big night for Harry Maguire, and you would hope that 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 gives those players that the lift that they've they've needed because both of them have been under the spotlight for for the ro- very wrong reasons this this season. And yeah. uh, and yet it was you know it was good to see them emerge as uh, as United's here on on what was a huge night given they'd lost their first two Champions League games. Yeah, and Chris, obviously you were there as well on um, on the uh, Tuesday night. Um, and Simon's right, it wasn't a great performance. But then, but then again, that they are coming into United do come into it on the back of three wins on the bounce. Um, you know, there's I mean the, the scoreline doesn't paint any pictures. Um, and they've won three on the spin. They go into that game on on Sunday. I wouldn't say full of confidence because it wasn't a great performance. But they must have they must have a lift by the fact that they've you know and particularly you know the nature for example of the win over what game was that a few weeks back it seems like, when when they won the last minute um, Brentford. oh Brentford Scott McTominay um, twice in in injury time the nature of that and then the nature of the win on Tuesday with Nana pulling off that penalty save you know. It's a little bit like United of old, you know, um, pulling out the bag late on. So it's not a forlorn hope against City, is it, on Sunday? I don't know. If Man City have it sounds if like Man City aren't out of first gear yet, I don't know what gear Man United are in. They must be in reverse. But it's it, it they are showing, I suppose, a bit of character. And I suppose if, you, if you're looking at it as a glass half full outlook, they're not playing great, but now they're winning games. Whereas the start of the season, they weren't playing great and they were losing them. So it's it the the hope if you were a United fan is that if they can keep drawing and out the results, that when they get players fit, that this will start to click again like it did last season. The the fear if you're looking at it from a half glass half empty is when is is it going to click in time? And it's is it going to click in time for Sunday when they're playing the treble winners? So. Have they got? They they'll go into it a bit more confidence than they would have say if it happened if this game was three four weeks ago. Um, yeah. Oh, they can take a bit of hope from the Arsenal game. I know they ended up losing it three one, but they were competitive in that game. Um, but you'd have to be looking at City, even City not at the best yet this season. Coming to Old Trafford, United not at the best. If it if it if City get an early goal the mood could 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 turn quite sour quite quickly. So that would be the fear. And I think the midfield is the problem. Um City have Rodri back. Um he was a huge loss yeah. for them at Arsenal. Um people talk about De Bruyne is obviously would be arguably outside of Haaland their best player and he's a huge, huge loss. But they weirdly can seem to survive without De Bruyne. I don't think they can not they can win games without Rodri, but against the very best teams they need Rodri. And they'll have him up against the Man United midfield, which has been dysfunctional so far. I don't think Ten Hag has kind of found the right balance yet with the new players he's brought in there. Casemiro has had a terrible start to the season. Um, although mm-hmm. he is 31. The way he's talked about, I think he's 41. But he's been terrible. There's no getting away from that. Um, so they need to get that midfield right. That's their only hope, was if City can play through that midfield and get the ball to Haaland against the makeshift makeshift Man United defence, which it still is, then it could be could be ugly for them. Simon, I, I, um, Harry Maguire. Um, it's a good story, isn't it? So Harry Maguire, he's played three games on the bounce now. Um, obviously, he had some strong things to say when he was with, with England. 
about how he was going to stay and fight for his place. And he does point out that it, um, the win record, um, Manchester United's win record with him in the side as opposed to none on the side is is remarkable. 94%, 16 wins in 17 starts. The other one, by the way, was the one in Seville when he had a shocker. Um but also, don't those stats just skew things a little bit in that maybe Ten Hag is playing them against teams that United should beat? Well, maybe he's coming in for the lesser games. But, I mean, Harry Maguire is a, is a great story. Southgate's yeah. kept faith with him. Um, and he's an absolute lesson in resilience and perseverance for any any person in life, really. Or, and certainly footballers yeah. who, are, who, who are feeling down and out. The manager clearly doesn't believe him in, believe in him, but... The last three games, he's he's come in. I mean, Man you lost half their half their games this season. It's pretty pretty remarkable. And I think Harry Maguire, with the experience he's got, and I know he can have ups and downs, and he can make the odd error. But I think the vilification and the kind of the Mickey taking and the uh, the the mocking that he gets on social media from rival fans and maybe even his own fans um, is really really appalling. He's a top level player, and I think he's done really well for England. Um, and, I, and I think when he comes through this period and he and he establishes himself either back at Man U in that team or at another club, um, I think we'll admire him as a person and a, and a player more than we have done two years ago. Um, and the, the question about Man United is, that, are, they, are we seeing them as top four genuine contenders or are they functioning so poorly that they're now just considered an, an upper mid-table um, Premier League team because then they're, they're not. If you look at the way they're playing, they're not as fluid or as pacey or as dynamic as as their rivals are playing. Um, and it's a real worrying time. But on the on the Harry Maguire um, story, it, it, you know, I, I really do admire him. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree in terms of fluidity of the team. I mean, I think they were, as I say, I was at that Brentford game, uh, and I think Brentford are are quite limited actually, but they were extremely lucky. To win that game, um, I thought they were a little bit fortunate on, um, on on Tuesday nights, and I can't really see them getting anything at Galatasaray away, which I think they'll have to if they're going to qualify. Interesting point, Mox. How do you see? I mean, actually, just just quickly, Mox. First of all, are you yet to be convinced by the keeper at Man United? And then, secondly, how do you actually see the game panning out on Sunday at Old Trafford? Well, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm firmly in Chris's camp. Um, I'm a massive fan of Rodri. I think he's probably the best midfielder in the in the world at the at the moment. And I think for all the fa fanfare about Kevin De Bruyne and the and the assists and the fact we all love watching him play, I think Manchester City are a far far poorer team. You know, uh, without Rodri, I think he's absolutely vital to everything Guardiola does. He's like the quarterback. He sets up. He's so physically imposing. He sets up um, attack after attack. He always seems to be in the right place at the right time. So, yeah, I agree with the analysis um, from, from the other guys, really, in terms of, and certainly what uh, Chris's dissection of it with respect to, um, you know, the midfield being a key area. And also, you know, um, from what Simon's just said about the uh, age profile of Manchester United, it just does seem to be that, um, you know, with the likes of Casemiro and Ericsson, that they, they seem to be lack a little bit of fizz, to be perfectly honest with you. I thought they were... A, Massively lucky to get that decision last season that went in their favour. I think that was one of the travesties of, of last season, quite honestly. Uh, you know, it was just, um, uh, I'd have been uh, tearing, te what little hair I've got, I'd have been tearing it out if I was stood in the Manchester City enclosure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't see Manchester, they're like, um, I've just taken in my car for a, for a, uh, for a problem and it's been juddering and one of the coils in the, in the, in the engine's not been firing properly and, and it affects the performance. And I just get the feeling to draw an analogy with Manchester United, that's where they are at the moment. They're not, they're, there's, there's something there. They're able to sort of like get from A to B, but they don't do it with any smoothness. There's no confidence in what might happen from one week to the next. And I think with Manchester City, everybody knows what they're doing. There's a level of performance. And it's a, and again, to extend the car analogy, it's a much smoother ride at the moment. Oh, very good. Very good. Did you like I do like. I thought I was going to say it was a bit like yourself. You're sort of judging from A to B, and there's a part of you going wrong, Mox, at your stage <laughs> you've just, in life. You've just, given, you've just given Andy an intro there for for Sunday. <laughs> I thought you were going to write. Right, so I, I can extend it to Wayne Rooney if you want. But I mean, you know, but, so. yeah, hey, Mox, don't don't worry. I've just I've just I made a note at the start that we are going to come on to that because I'm I'm very very interested in that, and we will come on to that specifically and what happened last night. We'll get rid of the Premier League stuff, and then we will come on to that. Um, I was going to do this at the end, but I might as well do it now, seeing as though we're talking about it. Predictions for 
Sunday, Simon Mullick first. Um, I'm going for it. I've got, you, have to go for, you have to go for a City win. You have to go for I, I think they'll win quite comfortably as well. I think I'll go for a 3-1 City win. Simon? Uh, City 2-0. Chris? City 3-0. Marks without the car? Uh, yeah, City 3-1, three, three, 2-0. Yeah. So I, I'll see it being fairly comfortable, mate, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, I think I think City will win, and I, I think they might win. I, I agree with you guys. I think they, they might win. They might actually win very comfortably. I do think the United got some, you know, issues at the back. I mean, with Maguire, it's funny because you know he was quite rightly um, um, praised after the game against Copenhagen, but it was easy to forget that actually he made a he made a terrible rick very early on from which they should have scored. And of course, they actually hit the post in the instead. And I think they might get a torrid time at the back. Yeah, I think City, I think United will score, but but City 4 1. Just another couple of Premier League games I want to quickly look at and broaden them out. I did say someone asked me yesterday what we were going to do today and talk about. And I mentioned a few things. And I said we're also going to quickly talk about whether or not Spurs can win the title. And and and, and he replied, Oh, you're branching into comedy then, are you, Dunny? I said, Well, that's it can't be comedy at the top of the league. Mox can Spurs win the title? Will they beat no, Palace this no. weekend and can they win the title? No. Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll probably. Yeah, they'll probably. I don't. I don't know. It's at Palace, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, they're a different. They're a different. Uh, they're a different side at home, but they've got a monumental injury list at the moment. Crystal Palace. Uh, one of my pals is a, a Palace fan, and and he was delighted to get a, a goal of straw against Nottingham Forest. Uh, I know Forest are a different. Um, a different kettle of fish this this season in terms they're a little bit more uh, resilient obviously steve cooper's added um you know uh, a lot of, a lot more bodies to what was already a packed dressing room but um the fact that palace were celebrating a goalless draw against uh, against yeah. um the lads on the city ground just you know sort of shows the depth of the the, the injury problems they've had uh, listen I, I mean i think the most amazing thing about spurs is that everybody's woken up to what a great talent james madison is I mean, I have to be honest, the fact that he played for Leicester City in, in two seasons where Leicester finished fifth and was a you know an important fulcrum of, of Brendan Rodgers' side seems to have passed everybody by, really. I'm just surprised that it's taken him to get down to North London before everybody's realised yeah. what a good player he is. It seems to me that he's the one one person who's made um, uh, and Big Angie's life a lot easier in terms of you know the post-Harry Kane era. And uh, quite frankly, it's it's. I have to say they're the great underachievers in English football, aren't they, Spurs? Yeah. But um, and, and genuinely, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to see them. I'm pleased to see them doing well. But I just don't see that they've got the potentially got the strength in depth to see themselves over the line with, um, you know, by by mounting a realistic title challenge. Hey, I hope I'm proved wrong, but I don't see them intrinsically being stronger than the likes of Manchester City and Liverpool. Or Arsenal, if I'm being honest with you. No, I mean, I think you're right. You, you, you make a great point about Madison. I, I will blow my own trumpet momentarily. I, I did when you asked to do the signings of the summer. I thought Madison, and, and I wrote it was was by far and away in terms of value for money, yeah. was the signing of the summer. It was an absolute steal. I mean, Spurs stole a march on people. Almost got the deal done under the radar, didn't they? Very early on in, in the summer got the deal done and was signing an absolute proven playmaker, a, a proven chance creator, a proven game changer for what was it in the end? 40 million? Is it 40, 40 million? million. Yeah, yeah, and I remember, I remember at the time... Sorry, Andy. Yeah, and I, I remember at the time that the, the, the Spurs were signing Madison for that sort of money and in the meantime, and again, no offence to the player, I think he's a very honest, good, hard-working player, Manchester United were signing Mason Mount for, for £60 million. Pounds. And I just, I'm looking at the two and I'm thinking... I just don't get this. Simon, you mentioned before that you thought it was a three-horse title race. I assume you mean um, City, Arsenal, Liverpool, yeah? I, I do, yeah. And I think... I if think you could just quickly just say about Liverpool, they they, they they good win last week. Liverpool, they look as though they're flying again, don't they? 2.0 Liverpool, as they're called, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, kind of, they're kind of under the radar. No one was really talking about them this, at the start of this year. Klopp had a few tweaks to make. But, you know, they only lost once, and that was to Spurs um, this season. So, Liverpool are, are absolutely 
in there and you're going to expect them to to put a run together but Tottenham are going to Tottenham are a really interesting story this year in terms of I see parallels with with Newcastle last year or the last 18 months at Newcastle where there's a unity there's an optimism there's a freshness about the whole thing with a new manager they've got new Europe this year which Newcastle didn't have last year which gives them an extra impetus I think that's worth another te- you know 10 points even uh, in a season with the, the the game preparation that they can do so I think for Spurs, Champions League is possible. Um, I know the top of the league at the moment. They can they can dream and they can, that's what football's about. And they can have that adventure. But to, if they can get top four, they're going to be seriously damaging. Or top five, it might be this year for Champions League. They can be seriously damaging one of the traditional rivals who who get into the Champions League every year. Simon, how many challenges to Man City this season? Arsenal, yeah. Liverpool, any more? I, 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 I go back to what, what Simon Bird said earlier. I think it's... Um... I think it's it's a much more open season this year. Uh, you know, we've already seen City losing it. You know, they've lost at Arsenal, obviously. They lost at Wolves as well. So they drop points. And I think uh, I I don't think it's going to be another 95, 96 point season. I think there will be a lot of points dropped by all the top clubs along the way. And I think that's good for the, I think that is good for the Premier League. You know, it would be great if we could have five or six teams kind of you know, really tight at the top until the sort of very, very last knockings of the season. And uh, going back to Spurs, it would be great if they could just add to the numbers maybe in January because they agree with what the other guy said, that they're just a little bit light in terms of quality and depth. But the great thing about Spurs, they're a fun watch again, which, yeah, you know, yeah. it, it, everybody used to go to Tottenham Stadium and you know it would be packed out every week, and and you could just see the kind of the misery on the fans' faces, and the fans are smiling again. The fans are excited again. Um, you know, and just made a, just such a, a massive impact in, in a short space of time. And they're a great watch. You know, they they took on Arsenal the other week, and 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 really gave Arsenal problems in, in for, for long stages of that game, and could have won. So uh, yeah, it's great seeing Spurs there again, and it's great seeing the fans kind of going to the games again, and. And being entertained, they've obviously had a, quite a, I wouldn't say an easy start to the season, but they, you know, Liverpool apart, and obviously Liverpool finished the game with nine men. They've kind of, and obviously Arsenal, they've had a, a, a games that you would expect them to win. Um, so there are bigger challenges coming for Spurs, but like I said, it's it's good to see them. Um, it's good to see them sort of playing again and, and entertaining their fans. Yeah, no, I think you're right, and and I really hope. I think it really could be. When you mentioned the 92, 93, 94 point season not happening this time around, I think you might be right. I'm hoping what will happen is I think you've got five five great teams there at the top. I include Newcastle and Spurs along with Arsenal, um, Liverpool and Man City. But then, of course, beneath that, we've got a level of team, which I would now include Chelsea, who will surely improve under Pochettino. Aston Villa are playing some great stuff under, under Emery even West Ham. These are teams that are going to take points off the big teams as well. So hopefully what we'll see, hopefully, I mean, we'll be talking about five months' time as City are clinching the title with five games to spare probably, but hopefully it'll be wide open. Mox, I am going to come back to that last night because I did want to speak about that. I was just writing a couple of things down this morning for the column tomorrow, and I was just writing a thing down saying, you know when sometimes you just know some appointments are just wrong? And from my personal point of view, I knew that when Everton appointed Rafa Benitez, it just was wrong from day one, from minute one. Mm. Is there a slight feeling that might be the case with Wayne Rooney and Birmingham City? Uh, well, let's put it like this. He arrived, he sort of walked out. The, anybody familiar with the layout at St Andrews knows that the managers um, walk out to the dugouts from a, a tunnel in the corner of the pitch. And he pretty much walked out to a very, very subdued um, fanfare, if that's the co- correct word. Um, there's still a, a great deal of hurt here that uh, John Eustace, who battled gamely through, you know, all sorts of problems, wasn't given the proper chance to to, to see the job through or see, at least see where the job might have ended up. And um, by, by half time, uh, he's, both Rooney and his team were being booed off, and at full time. That had been ratcheted up, off, uh, ratcheted, ratcheted up to, you know, the inevitable. Uh, would you like to go back to America, please, Wayne? Um, <laughs> from a few voices in in the old main stand. So um, as as entrances go, it was pretty much down there. I mean, you can you're right. Um, Rafa Benitez at Everton, Alex McLeish yeah. at uh, Aston Villa after he spent oh, yeah. time at Birmingham. 
So uh, it, it, at the moment, it does have very much have the feel of a, um, uh, a, a jumbled mess, quite frankly. I mean, um, I sort of made uh, reference to the fact that the club had basically loaded a 12 ball shotgun and then pointed it squarely at their own feet. Absolutely. I mean, everything was going well. The new owners were in, they were making the right noises. Eustace had been given a few um, a few plays, there'd been a bit of money spent, they were disrepair. The punters weren't being over weren't being over expectant in their in what they were demanding, and everything seemed to be going um, you know, okay. and then you know, as Birmingham City, Andy Birmingham City can do, and uh, Gary Cook, with whom Simon Mullock's had, uh, and you probably yourself have had uh, dealings, yes. uh, managed to uh, managed to pull the trigger and we are where we are and he's got a, he's got a difficult he's got a difficult task now in, in turning it around uh, even after two games because of the ridiculous brief and fanfare with which he was appointed exactly Mark. That, that's the thing you see is that it is that you know listen i'm sure we all hope because you know, we've all dealt with wayne rooney we all like wayne rooney we all hope that he makes a success of of not just this job but of his um, entire managerial career it's great he wants to stay in that game However, it's a combination of things, the affection for John Eustace around the club. And then combined, these these guys must think they're punters and mugs. This talk of like, oh, we'll, we'll get him because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna play no fear football. As if people are gonna be impressed by that. The only thing that makes fans do is say, Are you sure? Are you for real? You know, yeah, I mean, no, are no, you no. for real? I mean, what do you mean, no fear football? I mean, it's just well, it's ludicrous. Yeah, I mean, and that combination just I think adds to what will inevitably become toxic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I asked Gary Cook to um, to uh, elaborate to, on no fear football. Out, outline what no fear football was. He was the one that oversaw the, you know, the message on the website that went out to the club supporters, yeah. and it was a, a, a blathering load of American corporate speak yeah. nonsense, as you won't be surprised to learn. Um, yes. uh, because there's just no term that can encompass it, really. Um, it's this, you know, the the, the backdrop to the soundtrack to last night was a screeching of tyres. As uh, Rooney, you know, came into the press conference afterwards and hit hit reverse within a matter of minutes. He basically went into the dressing room afterwards and said, "Look, lads, can't can you do this or not?" And I think the message was, "No, we can't. We want to go back to doing what we yeah. were doing." Frankly, so um, yeah. the whole thing's just an absolute car. I'm like my car analogies today, don't I? You are fun. An absolute car crash, to be honest with you. But you. you know, look, it's still fairly early in the season, and you're right, season. And you're right, Wayne Rooney. Was a wonderful footballer, you know, generational talent, street fighter. We loved him to bits, you know. And and as a bloke, I'm told he's fantastic. But I, yeah. I think all you lot are nice blokes. I wouldn't want you in charge of Birmingham yeah. City. I'd be with a great respect. True, true. Right, I'm going to make one final um, one final turn to use your coronary um, mocks. And just quickly, boys, I think on Monday, it's the announcement of the Ballon d'Or winner. I would just like a take from each of you on, I mean... A, who you think will win it, and B, who you think should win it. I'll start with Simon Mullock first. Um, Messi's going to win it, isn't he? Because yeah. he, he led Argentina to the World Cup. I mean, it's the worst kept secret in, in football at the moment. Who should win it? Uh, Haaland would normally be the, the outstanding rival, you would think, given the, the amount of goals he scored and the fact that Manchester City did the treble last year. But I'm going to throw one... Uh, sort of put one out of the area. On, Julian Alvarez, oh. World Cup winner. What a shock! It's from City. Is playing, but he, but he, he won. Julian Alvarez completed football last season. Um, you know, you, he, nobody is gonna is gonna get a better season than that. And let's be fair, you know, was he a bit part part player? Yeah, he, he was, but he still scored very important goals and still mm. scored a lot of goals and has continued that this season. So, um. Who's going to win it? It's going to be Lionel Messi. Haaland should win it, really. But I just sort of okay. throw uh, Alvarez in there as a little Interesting curveball. Interesting take, Simon. Well, if it wasn't for the World Cup, Haaland would win it with 61 goals in, in what was it, 50-odd games. Um, but obviously, Messi Messi will win it for capping his career with with that World Cup. So, yeah, it it's pr pretty much should be a foregone conclusion. Um, any other season, Haaland. But, but Messi's for me. Chris? Um going to be very boring and say pretty much the same, but yeah, yeah um, Messi won the World Cup, but I think it should be looked at. He's gone to the MLS and then since, and he's not, his club career as in, as in being he, PSG didn't do much. So that's why it should be Haaland, but 
Messi's got enough of them. He should give give a, give a couple away and maybe let somebody else have a go at it. But you know what's coming. It's the Messi Messi loving and I suppose winning a World Cup to cap your career. You can't argue with it too much. Mox, we'll finish with you. Um, I think, and by the way, I, I, Messi will win it, and, and I think he should win it as, as it happens. But um, Mox, um, Messi will win it. I'll finish with you, but I'll just ask: let's 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 bet without Messi. Who who should win it without Messi? Well, I'd just go. I'd just refer to you know the greatest manager possibly of all time, who said um, uh, he scored fifty million goals for us and won the treble. So um, that was what Guardiola said again about Haaland. And, and, and I've got to be honest, I'd give it to Haaland above Messi. I know there's a romantic, uh, a romantic, uh, romantic, romantic element to it. But to be perfectly honest, if you look at cold hard facts, I mean, does it get much better than that? You know, but yeah. That's that's my, that's my humble. Sorry, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I would I would say Haaland was fantastic. I mean, I, I, he didn't he didn't score in the Champions League final or the FA Cup final, did he? Haaland he didn't have a great end to the season. And I, I just think, listen, he, he, he's an outstanding candidate, but Messi, I think the difficult thing is, is that World Cup was so long ago. I mean, literally, it was, well, probably this time last year, we were all packing our bags and getting ready to go out yeah. there, weren't we? Almost, I can't remember, it was November or whatever. So, but I think Messi will win it. Mox, to use your car analogy, and we're going to have to put the handbrake on, um, get out of the car, finish this up, and the lads, enjoy the weekend, enjoy the Premier League. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. And we'll see you same time next week.